From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. They may both have a D next to their name on the September ballot, but voters in East Providence have two very different candidates for state senate to choose from in the primary. Incumbent state senator Daniel DuPont has served seven terms in the General Assembly. A financial advisor, he's chairman of the powerful Senate Finance Committee. State Rep Roberto De Silva wants to take his place. He served two terms in the House and is a lieutenant with the Pawtucket Police Department. DuPont, De Silva, head to head on this campaign 2012 edition of Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and political reporter for Rhode Island Public Radio, Ian Donis. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. State Senator, State Representative, thank you very much for agreeing to come onto the program and help voters uh, choose who to decide uh, come September. I want to begin first with a very simple opening question. I will give you each 30 seconds to respond, and, and we'll start with the incumbent. Uh, Mr. DuPont, why should voters reelect you to State Senate? Well, I'm a lifelong uh, resident of East Providence. I've chosen to uh, start a business here, start a family here. Uh, I've represented the citizens uh, in the Senate uh, in the past, and in the past f uh, four years in particular as chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, during some very difficult times, I think I've demonstrated the leadership uh, that was required to take on tough issues uh, and try to turn the ship of state around uh, and put us in a better uh, setting going forward. All right, Mr. Uh, De Silva, again, why should voters elect, elect you to state senate? Well, I want to be a, vo a voice for my constituency. I want to be a voice for the people of East Providence. When I uh, go up to uh, uh, the state senate, uh, when I vote and make decisions on legislation, it's going to be on what's in the best interest of my community, not on what's in the best interest of leadership. And I think I, I've shown through my track record that uh, at times I've taken a stand against leadership, and that's what you need. You need somebody who's not just going to go along to get along. All right, gentlemen, let's uh, begin first with pension reform, and Mr. De Silva, we'll start with you. You were one of 17 lawmakers who voted against the landmark uh, Pension Reform Act. Um, in the East Providence Post, uh, you said, quote, important things were left out of the reform. There are people in the system that never paid the actuarial cost of their pensions, former legislators, judges, and insiders who got special deals. So um, the question to you is, did you file a bill to deal with those inequities? Well, here's, here's why I voted against the pension reform. It, it wasn't because I was against pension reform. I believe in pension reform, and I, I seriously believe that we needed some type of reform. What I was against was the method by which we did this. It was a rushed bill that got put through my way or no way or, or the highway. Um, similar to what happened with stu uh, 38 Studios, where it's hashed out behind closed doors, comes out to the floor. We'll get to that in a minute. The question said, to you was, did you file a bill to deal with the inequities that you're bashing pension reform for? I didn't uh, file a bill in particular, but I supported amendments that were put on the floor. The um, pension reform estimates are East Providence will save $4.5 million in 2013, Pawtucket where you're a police officer, will save $6.8 million. And that's, that's all admirable, and, and I think that's important for pension reform. My thing is, I'm not saying that I was against pension reform. I wanted to see us do it like Providence did. They sat down at the table with the workers, and they were able to, uh, to achieve substantial savings by sitting down negotiating with the retirees and the workers. I'm, I'm afraid that this pension reform is, we know it's getting challenged now in the, in the, in the Supreme Court, Rhode Island Supreme Court, and what's going to end up happening is, if it gets reversed, we're going to be right back at step one. And we're going to be on the hook for millions of dollars in legal fees and, and damages and all kinds Are of other issues. Are you predicting a legal loss? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a legal scholar. I'm not a judge sitting in on the case. What I'm saying is that the argument has been made that there's uh, constitutional contract law issues that uh, affect this, this law. All right, Mr. DuPont, um, I'm going to have you respond to his assertion that this was shoved down the throat of lawmakers in a moment. But the first question to you on this is, how can you uh, justify dramatically changing the retirement system, uh, crying poor yet be poised to pay back upwards of $100 million in the 38 Studios mess? This is a moral obligation bond. Don't we have a moral obligation to our retirees and workers? Uh, I agree that we do. Uh, and I think the pension reform, as you look at what was uh, passed, uh, protected each dollar and each pension credit and service credit that any uh, either retiree or uh, active employee earned. Uh, I uh, disagree with the fact that this was, or the, the notion that this was rushed. We had uh, 30 hours of public testimony before the Joint Senate 
uh, and House Finance Committees. Uh, I personally engage with a variety of the stakeholders from constituents who were concerned about was, what was being proposed to uh, labor leaders throughout the process. So this was not something that was done uh, on a whim. The Treasurer had done her Truth and Numbers report. She had established a work group uh, and we had begun our research and our work uh, months before we had a final vote on pension reform. So this was not done uh, on a whim, but the reality is that we had a significant problem uh, that was unsustainable. And again, I'm not a, an attorney either, uh, but I think what's important to, to note here is that what employees and retirees earned has been protected. What has changed or what, be, or what well, benefits Well, how about it? Should forward? we be paying back that moral obligation bond to 38 studios and at the, on the other hand, uh, changing dramatically the retirement system? Well, I think the, the issue of moral obligation bonds is, is uh, an important one, and that's a, a, a way to issue debt. Uh, Should we be paying state? back the moral obligation bond? Uh, ideally, uh, it would be nice if we didn't have to, but I think if we do not pay back the moral obligation uh, bond, it could have dire consequences for future debt obligations that the state uh, would, would need to issue for a variety of investments and infrastructure improvements that may come down the road. Ted? Do you think we should pay back the 38 Studios bonds? I think uh, there's no moral obligation to the bonds, but I think there's also a moral obligation to the people who've given 35, 38 years of their life to a career in state service or or, you know, relying on this, on, on this, what they've planned for at retirement to be there. Uh, I think they're almost in the same category. You've got a moral obligation to the bonds, you've got a moral obligation to the people who work there. My big problem with the pension reform law is that we never called the people to the table and say, let's negotiate this, let's achieve some savings, like Providence did recently. We never had that sit down, we never had that honest conversation with, with the, the workers. It was, hey, this is what we're going to do, and, you know, that's it. You know, since you brought it back there, and Ted, I'm sorry, just a follow-up question to you then. Uh, you, look, you're a Pawtucket police officer, and we should point out the pension plan in Pawtucket is not managed by, uh, managed by the state, but your wife is a teacher. That's right. Your family directly affected by pension reform. That's should right. you have even voted on this legislation? I think, uh, I think absolutely. I mean, it's, it's an issue. It's, it's a class exception, okay? My wife, um, amongst thousands of other people I teach, is, you know, my wife who came to this country from the Dominican Republic, she, she uh, immigrated here to make a better life for herself. We put her through school together. We paid for her to go to school, and she went out, and she wanted to become an educator, and she became a teacher. There's nothing wrong with being a, a working person who wants to teach. And when I took a vote on that, I knew it would, it, that, that would be an issue that would come up, but that's not the issue. The issue is I was all for pension reform. I understand because I want there to be something there for all the current workers and the future workers. I, we need something there in place. I was just against this particular pension reform. Okay. Ted? Uh, you're both from, you represent East Providence and Pawtucket in this district, or you would. Um, all the mayors begged for help this past session, uh, and not much passed. I've heard from a lot of disappointed mayors since uh, the session ended that the General Assembly just ignores them and waits for another bankruptcy. Mr. DuPont, um, why did you mostly ignore the pleas of the mayors? Why didn't Senate Finance do more when they were begging for help with their financial problems? I wouldn't say that we ignore them. Uh, I think if you look at you know pension reform in dollars and cents, uh, the city of East Providence, as Tim mentioned at the beginning of the program, saves four and a half million dollars. Uh, but it specifically left out what I remember. I was there with you. I remember watching Mayor Tavares and the other mayors sit there and say, "Please include reforms to the independent plans," and that was ignored. Well, the independent plans, as uh, Mr. De Silva mentioned, are all governed by uh, contracts, uh, and the pension benefits and the benefit structures uh, are all uh, benefits that have been negotiated. Uh, through the years, uh, much different than the state system. All of the pension benefits to state employees and employees that are in the state system are all governed in statute. And the question that uh, was raised and the concern, quite frankly, with some of the requests from the cities and towns was our infringement upon those contracts. Uh, I think the question can be raised, and rightfully so, whether or not you know statute governing pension benefits would be considered a contract, but I think a document that's signed between two parties that establishes the non- or the private, let's say, uh, municipal pension plans is a much different animal. In so, so you're satisfied with what the assembly has done to help cities and towns as, as they're facing Chapter Nine? I think we've I think we've done a lot. I think there's certainly more to do, but I also think it's important for cities and towns to accept some responsibility. Maybe not some of the people that are presently in office. Some of them yes, some of them no. Uh, but I think uh, some of the problems that cities and towns have, particularly uh, as it relates to certain benefits. These were benefits that were negotiated but also given away uh, in past years by city councils and by uh, city and town mayors. Mr. De Silva, what would you do as a state senator to help cash strap cities and towns? 
Well, the first thing I would do is reverse the policy that we've had in the state where we are giving ta generous tax breaks to those people who can most afford to pay their taxes. Uh, companies, uh, generous uh, uh, tax credits to companies that really uh, are receiving a windfall. And at the same time, to balance those types of tax breaks, we're putting it on the people of the cities and towns by cutting over $200 million from the, the, the cities and towns. I mean, that's, how, do you, how do you survive from that? Uh, one of the first things I did up there as a freshman, my, my second year up there, was I voted against eliminating the, the car tax reimbursement because I thought it was wrong. That year, we were giving a tax break and a flat tax to people making over $250 millionaires, people making big money. Uh, we're giving them a tax break. And at the same time, to balance that tax break, we're, still, we're saying to people, look, we're going to eliminate the car tax reimbursement. And I know you've got a $6,000 car, and you depend on that car to get to work to your minimum wage job just to survive, but you're going to have to pay more on that vehicle now because we just gave a tax break. That's where I stand, and that's when, when I got up there as a, as a first-term legislator. What about on the expenditure side? But, uh, you know, they've asked for perhaps to lift um, uh, mandatory bargaining contracts and things with police officers like yourself when a city isn't in much trouble as East Providence is. Would you support that? Well, I support collective bargaining. I think if two people, two parties come to the table and they're able to negotiate, you can achieve substantial savings. I mean, it's been proven in other communities. But binding arbitration isn't really that. That's when someone comes in and says, you have no choice now, you have to take this. I, I, I don't know if it's, you have no choice, you have to take this. You have an arbitrator who listens to both sides and is able to uh, cull through the numbers and what's true, what's not true, and, and make, generally, I'll tell you what, from my understanding is uh, the workers don't like to go to binding arbitration because they lose oftentimes. Uh, the cities and towns. So would you support lifting binding arbitration? I don't know if I would support that. Mr. DuPont, Rhode Islanders have seen some big increases in the amount of car tax they pay due to steps taken by the General Assembly. How do you support uh, that? How do you defend supporting that move at a time when Rhode Island has such high employment and the state is struggling economically? Well, I think it's important to highlight uh, the car tax reimbursement uh, program and how it started. And it started at a time when the state was flush with cash, quite honestly. Uh, and the state was basically reimbursing car tax uh, uh, automobile owners for the tax on the first $6,000 of the value of their vehicle. Uh, we saw revenue uh, decreases of close to $500 million uh, in the fiscal year where the proposal uh, to eliminate the car tax reimbursement was made. The reality is uh, many cities and towns were, was a, were able to hold the line and not pass uh, the entire amount onto, uh, onto uh, automobile owners. Uh, other cities and towns like East Providence went to the uh, maximum $6,000 limit. Uh, they, you know, they, they could have done some of their own bite, uh, belt tightening. Some chose not to, and others didn't. But I think, you know, again, the car tax reimbursement was the state of Rhode Island cutting a check for $186 million to automobile owners in cities and towns. And when you don't have that money, when your revenues are off by $500 million in one or two fiscal years, uh, you simply can't afford that. Mr. De Silva, what would you say to the same thing? Did you support the increase in car taxes paid by Rhode Islanders? Absolutely not. I, I, and or, like, let me ask you this then. If you didn't support that, where would you have made up the money I'll, specifically? I'll, I'll tell you, this is the thing that's disingenuous, and this is what people have to understand. At the same time, we're saying to all our cities and towns, hey, we're going we're gonna to cut all this money away from you, and you're going to have to go back to those vehicle owners to pay the difference. We're instituting a tax break for those people making over $250,000 to very wealthy people. We have tax... tax so you're saying you would have taken that money in terms of higher income earners increasing taxes on them, is that correct? We could have... Not, I'm saying we could have frozen the, the taxes. Instead of... The same year we said to our local people that, hey, we're going to eliminate this, this, uh, this, how my opponent says, the check that we're writing to you, well, that's tax relief to real people, people who have to work every day. That tax relief that we were giving to those people, we eliminated it so we can give tax relief to millionaires. That makes no sense to me. Let's keep the conversation there, uh, Mr. DuPont. Um, we have just a couple of minutes before we go to break, but you were the, one of the authors of a bill that dramatically changed uh, how it, the, the income tax rate here in Rhode Island, it lowered it for the upper income earners from 9% to, to about 5.99% or to 5.99%. So you just heard him. I mean, he's saying that that simply isn't fair, that we should be increasing taxes to those making over $250,000. Your response? Well, I, I think my, my opponent's uh, assessment of the income tax reform is just flatly incorrect. Uh, we had a complex income tax structure before where we had a top rate of 9.9% and we had a list of 88 credits and deductions. So it's not so much about what the top rate is, it's about what the effective rate is. So if you owe you know, $10 in income taxes, but you have 88 deductions and credits to pick from, and what you really owe after all those deductions and credits may be $3, uh, we had a high tax rate on the books 
uh, that was out there for every business in America and every person potentially looking to come to Rhode Island to see that simply wasn't real. How, how about it, Mr. De Silva? He says you don't get it. When, when I walked out the door, as I've been doing since I, I started campaigning, the one thing I hear from people is, why, why am I paying these car taxes? Why are my real estate property taxes going up? Well, I'll tell you why your real estate property taxes going up. Because we, as a state, the leadership at the state has decided we're going to cut millions of dollars from you. We're going to restructure the tax code to benefit a certain few elite, privileged, uh, well-to-do people in the state. That's the problem with tax policy in our state. I supported the Samini bill that would have raised that, that tax rate back up. Where there were 37 signatures from the people on the House that signed that bill. The bill never came out. Leadership never let it come out. The bill would have raised the income tax on people making two fifty. I think it was two fifty or three hundred thousand dollars or more. And then it would have came down incrementally every time that the the uh, unemployment rate was reduced. Every time the unemployment rate was reduced by one percent, that tax rate would have came down. So there would have been, would have been some accountability. Would you have supported that, or why wouldn't it have worked? No, I think the income tax reform that we passed. If you are a parent, if you live in an apartment, if you have a few kids. Uh, that's who benefits from the t uh, personal income tax reform that we did. 75% uh, of Rhode Islanders uh, got relief in the personal income tax reform uh, that we passed. If you are, if you don't have a mortgage, if you live in a big home, uh, if you do make over 250, you're not going to benefit from the personal income tax reform. All right, gentlemen, we have to take a break. Our guest this week on Newsmakers, we have State Senator Daniel DuPont, State Representative Roberto De Silva, and they are both running for State Senate in District 14, East Providence. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, we have Ted Nisi from WPRI.com and Ian Donis from Rhode Island Public Radio. Our guests this week, State Senator Daniel DuPont and State Representative Roberto De Silva. They're both running for District 14 State Senate in East Providence. Ted. Uh, Mr. DuPont, you told the East Providence Post you thought it was, quote, suspect that uh, Mr. De Silva stated his challenge of your Senate seat was not highly personal. Explain, explain why you thought that. Well, I think uh, Mr. De Silva, when he ran four years ago, uh, I supported him, um, and, uh, and there have been you know, some significant differences of opinion uh, at a variety of levels. Obviously, we've talked about some of them uh, today, mostly on policy, but also uh, politically. Uh, and so, you know, quite frankly, Mr. De Silva could have ran for re-election to, uh, to his seat. Uh, he has talked about uh, redistricting as being a major issue uh, as to uh, why he's running against me. Uh, I would simply say that if he has an issue with redistricting, uh, it should probably be taken up with the House leadership and not uh, myself in the Senate or the Senate as a whole. Mr. Silver, respond. Response is this. Look, I had an option. I could have ran for a brand new uh, redistricted representative seat, 
or it could have ran for a brand new redistricted senatorial seat that was moved into uh, what is mostly my community and most of my old representative district. I had people approach me and say, Bob, look, uh, you know, we're going to lose you as, as our rep. And people in the community were reaching out to me and saying, you should consider going for the Senate seat. So I looked at the person losing that seat, been there 14 years, part of the leadership, part of the bad decisions that are affecting our state. And I thought to myself, I can do a better job. I can do a better job for the city of East Providence and for the whole state of Rhode Island. And that's why I decided to run for that seat. There, can we just uh, briefly be honest with the people at home? There's, by all accounts, a civil war between East Providence Democrats. Is this part of that, Mr. DeSilva? Absolutely not. Look, there were people on both sides of the issue. People telling me, hey, just you know, run for your rep seat. Uh, you know, a lot of people pushing me to run for the Senate seat. It had nothing to do with the party, uh, the party politics that's going on in East Providence. Do you think that's... I, no, I would disagree. I mean, uh, Mr. DeSilva has been aligned with the political leadership and the council majority that took the city uh, literally to bankruptcy's door. Uh, the state stepped in, uh, and our, my capacity as Senate Finance Chair, the Department of Revenue asked us to uh, free some resources and school aid and advance some money so the city could actually make uh, payroll uh, a few weeks later. Uh, and so, you know, the, the roots may be uh, political, but at the end of the day, uh, I think, you know, I've certainly been there for East Providence and will continue to be so uh, if I'm reelected. Very quick response. All I can tell you is what people are telling me on the street when I'm walking door to door. They don't feel so well served by uh, my opponent. I think I can do a better job and we, we need to change. Mr. Yeah. DeSilva, it looks like virtually all of your campaign contributions since 2011 have come from labor groups. How can you assure voters that if you win election you won't be doing the bidding of public employee unions? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's not a, a factual statement because it hasn't been virtually all from labor groups. It's been about 50-50 people from the community and then I've got some uh, people in PACs have supported me. The same PACs that have supported me have supported my opponent and, comp and continue to support my opponent. If you look at his campaign, campaign finance reports, it's the same people donating to both groups. Um, I do the bidding of the people of East Providence. You know, I haven't been afraid to stand up to leadership. I would ask my opponent, how many times has he stood up to leadership? Is he just up there to do leadership's bidding? Is he a go-along to get-along kind of guy? Or is he going to stand up there and fight for the people of East Providence? A, res a response from Mr. DuPont, and is this election a referendum on the strength of labor in East Providence? Uh, it could be. I, I have uh, some unions that are supporting me, uh, have supported me in the past. I think the difference is uh, when we disagree on issues uh, and a matter of policy, uh, I've engaged them, sat down with them, and if at the end of the day we agree to disagree, uh, then so be it. But I think, uh, I think anyone can say that, uh, particularly during the past four years since I've been finance chair, I've had an open door policy, I solicit input, I listen to uh, suggestions, and then make uh, what decision I think is the most appropriate one on behalf of the taxpayers, not just of East Providence, but the entire state of Rhode Island. You both voted to create the loan program that led to uh, the $75 million 38 Studios loan. Do you owe Rhode Islanders an apology, Mr. De Silva? I don't owe an apology. I'll tell you who does owe an apology. People in leadership who knew where <laughs> the inner workings of where that money was going. We were under the impression this money was going to go to help small businesses during these tough economic really? times. Really? That's the impression you had that, with all the coverage that was happening at that time? I We didn't know it was going to go to one particular 38 Studio. Sh you would have... So do you feel like you voted on something you didn't no, really no. know No, we voted about on something it? that was told to us that, hey, this is going to be used to uh, give uh, some credit to small businesses in East Providence to help them out of the, the, the economic morass that they're facing. It wasn't said this is going to go specifically to 38 Studios. We didn't know that. So you were shocked when 38 Studios got that money? I'm not in the back room making the deals. I didn't know about 38 Studios. Is, is your opponent studios. one of those people in the back room making the deals? I'm not sure. I, I know he's part of leadership. All right, Mr. Maybe DuPont, he uh, answer the question. Do you owe Rhode Islanders an apology? He's saying leadership had a big part of that. You were in the inner circle on the Senate side. Uh, I will say that uh, those decisions were made above my pay grade. When uh, this expansion of the loan program uh, did happen, it came on the heels of the 2008 credit crisis. Banks were not lending. Small businesses left and right were complaining for additional access to capital. And this was proposed to us, or at least to me personally, as an expansion of a program to facilitate uh, additional resources to small businesses. Uh, there was word uh, in the press that 38 Studios was looking to come to Rhode Island, uh, but at the time that I voted on this legislation, I did not know uh, that $75 million of this expansion was going to go to one company. But you also didn't challenge it. We haven't had hearings in Senate Finance on the loan program. We hadn't. It didn't seem like the Assembly was upset until there were bad headlines in the past spring. Well, I think when things began to happen uh, and the authorities began to get involved, I think the, uh, and appropriately so, uh, I think the authorities, if they're, now, if they're now involved, they should do their work. And uh, upon completion of their work and their findings, uh, then we should look at it. But I don't think that the legislature uh, should be interfering with uh, a pending uh, what appears to be investigation. Ted. 
Um, you're both, uh, you mentioned it just now, but Mr. DuPont, you are now in your seventh term in the Senate. You've been there uh, for 14 years. Is there any limit on how many terms you would serve? Would you serve uh, 20 terms? How, how long could you see yourself staying on Smith Hill? I don't know. Uh, I, I think that I've demonstrated over and over again that during my time there that I've been a leader for change, uh, whether it be pension reform, the income tax reform, uh, the Municipal Fiscal Stability Act, uh, and most recently in the last budget, uh, distinguishing between simple expenditures and investments, making investments in the state's information technology infrastructure, stop our borrowing to make our 20% match for the transportation uh, projects that we do. Uh, we need to restructure our finances. I think I've uh, been a part of making that happen, and I think there's still some more to be done, and that's why I'm running again. Another change has been an increase in the unemployment rate to 10.9%. Do you bear blame on that side? Uh, th there's enough blame to go around. I think what, what we have here in Rhode Island is a crisis in confidence, quite frankly. Uh, businesses are not confident uh, that things are going to sustain and that we're not going to hit another double dip, so they're hesitant on uh, hiring more people. And I think, quite frankly, there's also uh, a confidence issue with some of our local governments where the state has tried to facilitate uh, businesses. And I think uh, if you look at the personal income tax reform, just to jump back at that, I think if you look at a Fidelity Investments, they will directly say, that they moved jobs from Massachusetts to Rhode Island because of that personal income tax reform, hundreds of jobs. And so there needs to be greater confidence in that the re slow recovery that we're seeing is here to stay. And I think the state's going to have to continue to work to facilitate uh, to not just grow jobs, but also educate our workforce so that they can qualify for those jobs. Mr. Silva, you've mentioned his long tenure uh, repeatedly during this debate. Uh, would you limit how long you'd stay up there? I, I Look, there's a limit every two years when we run for re-election. I, I let the people make that decision. Uh, would I be willing to set a limit? I think 10 years involved in uh, state government is something where you, you should have left your mark at this point. Uh, 14 years, part of the leadership, part of the decisions that have been killing this state and our local communities. You can't divorce yourself from that. To say you had no idea what was going on when you're the, you're the chairman of finance, you had no idea what 38 Studios was, that, that was the, the backroom deal that was going on. That's, that's to me, unbelievable. But uh, once again, I'm a person who's going to stand up for the people of East Providence. I'll stand up to leadership, and I've demonstrated that. I'm not, I'm not going to be a person who just sits there and says, you know what, uh, I'm going to listen to everybody what they have to say, but the, the, the bottom line is the decision's been made by leadership. I'm going to, I'm going to put the rubber stamp on what leadership just told me to okay, do. Okay, Mr. And that's Silva, we're running out of time, so briefly some quick yes or no questions to wrap up the show. Um, we'll start with you, Mr. DuPont. Yes or no, should same-sex marriage be legalized in Rhode Island? A form of it, yes. Okay, Mr. De Silva. I would say yes with the proper protections. Uh, Mr. De Silva, yes or no, would you vote in favor of binding arbitration for teachers? I would. And Mr. DuPont? Properly designed, yes. And quickly, uh, what letter grade would you give Governor Chafee? I'd give him a B. Mr. De Silva? C. And uh, for Senate President Teresa Pipe, weed? C. Mr. DuPont? I'd give her a B. All right, that's it for Newsmakers. Thank you for watching. You can catch it on WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, Ian Donna, some Tim White. You'll see us next week on Newsmakers. I'm not <laughs>